everybody. Welcome to Starting Line Church. We're really glad that you've joined us today as we continue our series called God in the Ordinary. This series is a study on the book of Ruth, which is one of the books of the Bible in the Old Testament. And this book is about how God is involved in the day-to-day joys and hardships of our lives, from really big, exciting moments down to the very ordinary ones, too. And so this series is about figuring out and paying attention to how God is at work in those ordinary moments of our lives. And our prayer is that we would see how God is in the middle of all of it. We see that in our story today, moments that seem normal in our regular life, God is present in and is using for something greater. Last week, to give us a refresher, we began our our God in the Ordinary series and we kicked it off with Ruth chapter 1. The story of Ruth takes place during the period of the Judges. This is this terrible time in history, in the history of Israel, where disobedience and idolatry and violence. And so in the midst of all of that, there's this famine in the land And so a man named Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, moved their family to a place called Moab. But during that time, they they had two sons, and him and his two sons died, leaving Naomi and his two daughters-in-law behind. And when it came time for Naomi to return back to her homeland, she tells her two daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. But Ruth remains faithful to Naomi and goes with her. And even though Ruth, she wasn't an Israelite, she begins to show her loyalty to God. All while Naomi is bitter because of all that she's lost. And so last week we broke down the concept that sometimes we're emptied so that we can be filled. That takes us up to our part in the story today. Today, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2, where Naomi and Ruth, they're, they're now in this process of figuring out what life looks like in this new season for them. And part of what it looked like was in the harvest fields. When, when we and barley were ready to be harvested, harvesters were hired to cut down the stalks and tie them into bundles. To collect all of it. But God's law said that the corners of the fields were not to be harvested. And any grain that was dropped was actually left there for widows and orphans and foreigners and the poor. So they could come gather it and glean it and use it for food. And so the purpose of this law was not only to prevent land owners from hoarding it. But it also was to help feed the poor. It's it's this lesson to care for the marginalized in their midst as God cared for them as they were slaves in Egypt, like we talked about back in the Exodus series. And because Ruth was a widow and a foreigner, being from Moab with no means to provide for herself at the moment, she tells Naomi that she's going to go and she's going to go to the harvest fields to pick up and gather the stalks of grain that people left behind. And Naomi, Naomi agrees and Ruth goes. This moment probably could be summed up in a, in a quick, simple way. It reminds me of chores. Nothing is more ordinary than chores, right? Do you have a certain chore around the house that you just don't like doing? You can't stand doing it. If you do, you probably, it's probably the one you do anything you can to get out of. Maybe it's vacuuming, dusting, cleaning dishes, putting dishes away, yard work, laundry. The chore I don't like the most and don't do the most, is putting my clean clothes away. I don't mind doing laundry. I don't mind folding the laundry, but once it gets into the bedroom, it just stacks and stacks and stacks and piles and piles and piles. I'll do anything to get out of it. So in a way, 
this is what Ruth is doing. Ruth is doing her chores. She's performing her duties and checking off her responsibilities off the list for the day. Instead of just sitting around complaining about how much she didn't want to do it or depending on Naomi or waiting for good fortune to happen to her, she takes initiative and she goes to work. She did whatever she needed to do to provide for herself. And in the midst of that, unknown to her, she found herself in the fields that belonged to a man named Boaz. Boaz was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem. And he quickly becomes a part of this new season for Ruth and Naomi. That's where we pick up reading in Ruth 2, starting in verse 5. Then Boaz asks his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she's the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She'd been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, Stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they're harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you're thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and he th she thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I've heard how you left your father and mother in your own land to live here among complete strangers. So may the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully. For what you have done. So Boaz and Ruth, they meet. And Boaz recognizes Ruth and he inquires about who she is. And what he learned is a little bit about her. And he went over and he began to help her and he began to talk to her and he tells her not to go to any other fields, that she can get all the grain from his field. And he tells her that he would care for her. And he would protect her because she's a foreigner. He, he tells her that she can follow directly behind the harvesters in order to pick up the best grain because he was so impressed with her. And, and we see in Ruth's response that she's shocked by all of this. She's pleasantly surprised. That's probably an understatement in what she's feeling. This is huge for her and her family. And the moment things begin to change. Have you ever expected your life to change in a simple, ordinary moment? Do you ever just walk into work one day and think, I wonder if my life is going to drastically change for the better today? No, I'm sure you don't think that about a random Tuesday. But this is what happened to Ruth. And I don't think Ruth was expecting it. I don't think Ruth thought to herself, going to pick up all this extra grain is going to change my life. So hold on, I'll be right back. Ruth didn't go to the harvest field because it was this huge moment or this flashy thing or because she was expected, she expected that it would turn her life upside down. I don't think she was feeling that mundane tasks, chores, and things on her checklist were fun and exciting. Ruth was simply diligent to the task at hand. She went to the grain fields because it was what she needed to do in the moment. She pursued hard work. She pursued helping her family. She did it because it was what she had to do to survive. She was diligent in what she was called to do and all that she was responsible for. She wasn't too proud or embarrassed. She wasn't lazy and uncommitted. Ruth persevered and put herself out there and worked hard. She was diligent and faithful to the Lord and in the small everyday tasks and then left the rest up to God. And Ruth's task, though menial, tiring, and perhaps degrading out in the fields because she was a widow, was done faithfully. 
one of the many things that's significant about Ruth's interaction with Boaz was that it reflected God. Boaz helping Ruth is this representation of God helping her and providing for her and caring for her. It was this reminder that in the moments of the unknown, the Lord was with her and was providing for her. But God working behind the scenes and leading her to this moment, Ruth found and saw God when she wasn't even looking. Which leads us to our our kind of main point today. I think we see that God is at work even when we can't see. What we know about God, one of the many things we know about God is that he's living and active. That means that we don't serve a God who is a statue or who is dead or who sits back on his throne in heaven and says, good luck down there. I hope everything works out for you. No. Through his Holy Spirit, he talks with us and he walks with us and he is there with us. And better yet, he is active in the world today through situations and people and moments and interactions. God is always at work around us, whether we can pinpoint if he's moving or whether we can't. It's like when you're watching a play or a musical and what you see on stage isn't the only thing that's actually taking place, right? There's a whole thing and there's a whole world going on behind the scenes backstage that viewers can't see. And just like that, God is moving and he's active and he's at work even when we can't see with our own knowledge and our eyes and our timing. In our story today, there wasn't an arrow pointing to the specific field Ruth was supposed to go to. There wasn't this big, huge sign of by God written in the clouds saying, go to the field of Boaz. God's voice didn't come down through the air saying, go to the field of Boaz. No, it, it wasn't like the angel appearing to Mary at the tomb telling her that Jesus was risen. It wasn't a glamorous ordeal. It wasn't a big deal at all. In fact, she didn't even listen to God. Most likely, Ruth chose this field randomly. But don't miss it, that it wasn't random for God. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly where he was guiding her. He knew exactly which field would lead her to cross paths with Boaz. In Romans 8, we read that God works all things out for the good of those who love him. Now, that doesn't mean that everything happens in life is good. It means that God can take the ugliest and darkest and worst situations and use them for good in some way. It means that we don't need to know exactly what's happening to know and believe that God is up to something in our midst. His ways are higher. His timing is greater. His plan is better than anything we will ever understand. We might not know exactly what's going on, but we can be sure to trust that he does. We might not know what the future holds, but we can be confident that the one who does hold the future is walking with us. We may experience pain and sorrow in life's everyday moments, but we can be sure of the hope that we have in Jesus, that we will have trouble, but that Jesus has overcome the world. I want to encourage us today that in the moments that seem mundane and ordinary, God is at work even when we can't see. In situations that seem irrelevant or pointless, God is at work even when we can't see. In times of pain and darkness in our lives and in the world around us, God is at work even when we can't see. In circumstances that seem hopeless, we can expect and believe that God is at work even when we can't see because it's simply who he is and what he does. If you're praying for someone, keep praying. If you're desiring something that you feel God wants for you, pursue it. If you feel you need to make a change in your life, do something about it. If you want a relationship with Jesus to become stronger, find ways to grow. Read scripture with a friend. Learn how to pray. Join a more group. 
Ruth shows us that sometimes we need to step out of our comfort zone, step out in obedience and just be diligent with what we have or the only thing we know to do. She reminds us that we'll see more of God when we're putting ourselves in situations and places to hear him and look for him. If Ruth wouldn't have been diligent to the task at hand, she would have missed the opportunity to meet Boaz and experience this moment with him, which would eventually be a relationship that would change her life forever. Ruth shows us that we can't just sit around. We can't just wait for God to magically change our life when we do nothing to help the situation. Can God do miracles when we are doing absolutely nothing? Yes. Can God do miracles when we're not cooperating? Yes. Of course. Would Ruth and Boaz have met if she just stayed at home on the couch? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but that's not the point. I think the point is what Ruth shows us is that in order to see the blessing that comes from the ordinary moments in life where God is at work, even when we can't see, we have to look for it. We have to set ourselves up for it. And we have to put ourselves in situations where we can see it more clearly and more regularly like she did in that harvest field that day. It was in the ordinary moments of life that God was working and God was orchestrating things even when Ruth had absolutely no idea. It was in the everyday things where God showed up in an unexpected and beautiful way. And it all began when Ruth didn't even know and when she couldn't even see. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who is living and active. We thank you that you are moving in our world and in our heart. So Jesus, pour out your Holy Spirit on us in a way that strengthens us and encourages us to believe that you are at work even when we can't see. God, give us hope that you are in control, that your plans are greater, that when pain is real and brokenness is present, you would remind us that you are at work even when we can't see. Allow that truth to impact our hearts this morning, today, this week. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. We're really glad that you were here with us as we dove into the story of Ruth. Um, And as we continue it the next couple weeks, make sure to tune back in. It's going to be an awesome rest of our series. Uh, One of the things we do here at Starting Line is we give. We believe that giving our time, our money, our energy, our resources is giving back to God what he has blessed us with. So if you want to give here at Starting Line, we make that really easy for you. There are ways that you can do that as an act of worship. Um, and allow us to just keep doing what we're doing and keep functioning as a church. So we love you. We're praying for you. Um, If last thing, next week, Sunday, August 21st, um, in person, in our in-person gathering on Sunday morning, we are doing our first baptism service here at Starting Line. So if you're in the Cleveland area, please join us. It's going to be a summer celebration of all that God has done this summer. Um, But if you are looking to be baptized or just want to know a little bit more about how we do that here at Starting Line, please reach out to us. We'd love to have you either be baptized or just join us next Sunday. So we'll see you then and have a great week.